Welcome to TFR Let's Talk. I'm your host, Sopnil Bharatiya, and my next guest is Raman Sharma, VP of Product Marketing at DigitalOcean. Raman, it's great to have you on the show. Hi, Sopnil. Thanks for having me. Uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, the self-service model. If you look at the whole evolution of cloud and cloud native technologies, or if you look at infrastructure, what is happening is that a lot of companies, they need to have a digital transformation strategy. They need to have uh, a cloud strategy, right? And at times they need opinionated platform where the platform developers take decisions for them. And sometimes they want to handle things themselves. But the whole point is that they should be able to consume all these latest open source and cloud native technologies. So, so can you talk about how you have seen the whole model itself has evolved, where we used to run the whole lab stack, where, you know, versus you all get, you know, everything as a service model. Then we will talk about self-service model specifically. But if you can just quickly talk about how the market has evolved. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you if you think about uh, the cloud infrastructure and platform space, there are multiple ways you can get towards building your applications. There's a full DIY infrastructure as a service model. There is platform as a service model, which gives you basically not just compute and not just storage, but slightly higher level building blocks towards you know composing your applications together. And now increasingly there's the, the cloud native way of building applications, which is somewhere in the middle of these two. It, it has elements of infrastructure, but more optimal infrastructure. And then it has elements of you know not needing infrastructure, you know, some elements of PaaS as well, with Kubernetes and the whole ecosystem. So I feel like, you know, um, it depends upon the appetite of the de specific developer or developer teams around how much they care about control on the one hand versus pr productivity on the other. And we see all like we see people on all spectrums and uh, irrespective of where they belong on the spectrum, we believe in providing them an experience where they can self serve themselves. They don't should not need help from an expert or, or, a, or a service provider just to be able to get started with that platform. So that's kind of what we are uh, focused on. Right. Now let's uh, <clears throat> go a bit deeper into a, a self service model. Uh, once again, there are a couple of things that are happening here. Uh, we, uh, a lot of times companies want to move fast. So we also offer something called low code or altogether no code, you know, just SaaS model. And then you also have a model where they manage everything. So, so talk about exactly how would you define a self service model and what benefits developers see in this model? Yeah, so uh, in our mind, it's very simple. The self-service model is about removing all friction from the path of a developer towards successfully consuming your products and going about their business. Their business could be building applications, standing up businesses, you know, learning, experimentation. And low-code, no-code is one way of doing things. We are not in low-code, no-code space. We are very much a platform for tech technical practitioners, people who have slightly... Uh, deeper technical skills, whether it is development, programming, system system administration, or so on. But the whole idea is that starting from the point that you sign up on the website to onboarding and getting started with your first project, and then the next step to adding more team members to your projects, we want to make sure that all of this is super seamless. You should not, this should not be like rocket science for you. You should not require to talk to a, an army of consultants or maintain a team, a huge team of DevOps, just to be able to do these simple set of things. So we are feverishly uh, focused on making sure that this, exp this experience for developers and small development teams is super optimal. And that's what we believe self-service is all about, making sure that you, you are empowered and you have all the tools and all the knowledge available to get started with your projects in the cloud. Can you also talk about what kind of technologies you're offering through self-service? Because as you're saying, you know, it's easy, but if you look at the cloud native space, even Kubernetes, there are so many knobs to be turned and that does become intimidating at times. And that's why sometimes a lot of companies, they offer you know, fully managed services. So can you talk about the balance? You know, you did say that your audience is tech savvy, the people who do know about it. So, but what I want to understand is that at one hand, you're giving them full control so they can fine tune things 
but you know that they can do with their own stack but then we are also looking at the complexity they come with the cloud so how do you maintain the balance at the same time so a lot of new technologies are being developed so they may want to use the latest whether it's service mesh or whatever it is so can you talk about the balance between these three things where they get access to technology that they want but you also want to reduce the friction plus they should not have to deal with the complexity yeah i think that's a great question and i think first of all i would like to draw a distinction between the self-service nature of using our products and services on the one hand. And the second is you know, the, the different spectrum of technologies available, managed versus unmanaged. On the, first, on the first point, I would say that everything that we have in our product portfolio, whether it is Kubernetes, whether it is platform as a service, managed databases, or just core compute, uh, I, infrastructure as a service, everything is self-serve. What that means is that you can use these services yourself. You do not need like somebody to set up and create configurations just for you to be able to use and consume these services. That's just want to make sure that that point is clear. On the second hand, I think you have you're asking a great question, which is like how you know there is a DIY method of building applications in which you you do everything. You use compute, you set up load balances on top of that, you manage your own databases, you create your own storage, and so on and so forth. But what we are also seeing is that increasingly developers, they care a lot about productivity and not about the undifferentiated heavy lifting of the underneath of the underlying infrastructure. So we have, for example, we have created uh, services like App Platform, which we released last year, which is a fully managed platform as a service offering, which actually runs on top of our, our compute and our uh, Kubernetes infrastructure but it provides an experience to developers, which is very seamless. They don't have to worry about managing or orchestrating the underlying infrastructure. We do that for you. You focus on your code and just connect, you know, uh, app platform to your code repositories and we'll take care of the rest. Kubernetes is, 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 an, is an interesting, um, like somewhere in the middle right now. I think it has been a very interesting development in our market, I would say. Over the past couple of years, Kubernetes has become such a force. It has gotten so much mind share. And at some level, you can say that Kubernetes is still a bit complex for your everyday developer who just wants to write code and, and not worry about like the, the complexities that Kubernetes sometimes bring, brings. So the approach that we have taken there is like, just like everything else, we want to take complexity out of Kubernetes. We provide a very simple experience for Kubernetes and we try to stay as true to the Kubernetes philosophy as possible. We don't try to burden a Kubernetes user with a lot of additional concepts and additional terminology that you know many cloud providers these days are introducing. We provide as close a Kubernetes experience as possible while making sure that um, you know we manage certain elements of the Kubernetes um, stack for them. You hit uh, nail on the head when you're talking about removing complexity because when I look at developers, sometimes I look at, at them as artists, right? Uh, I mean, I am myself a creator, so if you're a poet or a, or, or a painter, you should not have to worry about what kind of pen and paper you're going to buy. You should focus on telling the, the, the poetry or drawing your art. So developers should not have to worry about unnecessary uh, complexity because what happens is that uh, not only it's about the 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 the, bra, uh, the 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 cells that you need to to create something plus the time that you need you're wasting too much of these two resources in just plumbing and doing things that are not adding any value to your business so all of your time should go towards that and less towards this underneath complexity which you mentioned you're taking care of now if you look at digital ocean you folks do a lot of things based on the feedback that you receive from your users. It's a company that closely worked with your users, in this case, developers. So can you talk about what kind of developer behavior patterns that you saw that you were more inclined towards offering self-service model? Yeah, so Sofnil, I think you I think you said it exactly right. So basically we think of our cloud as an open canvas and which is available for developers to come and express their creativity by, by building applications. And you know, very early in our life, we decided that we want to hyper-focus on the needs of developers, startups, and small and medium businesses, and not on large enterprises. And what that allowed us to do was just go deep into understanding the developer behaviors, as you pointed out. There are three things that I, I would say that really stand out for when, when you try to build products for a developer, you know, who's actually going to use the products and not for you know, a distant IT decision maker. 
So these three things are number one, developers really care about productivity. They want to be super productive. They want to find the most optimal ways of going about their day to day jobs, whether it is writing code, building it, debugging, setting up automation pipelines or, or deploying or, you know, making sure that version control, version control and all those things are working fine. That's number one productivity. Number two is, as you said, they want to focus on their core competence, which is the act of building software. Everything else is secondary. They want to write code. They want to express their business logic in terms of code. And they actually want everything else to take care of itself. Everything else is a support act, whether it is testing, deploying, automation, and so on and so forth. So products that allow them to focus on their core competence are actually winning in the market. And the third thing I would say that we have really, that really differentiates developers is this notion of learning and experimentation. You know, our industry is full of new technologies, more and more are getting added every single day. So they want to make sure that the platform they adopt actually enables that learning. And experimentation is very, very important because I think one thing that cloud should enable everyone to do is test their ideas quickly and inexpensively. While that was the original promise of the cloud, I don't see a whole lot of that happening. What we are trying to do is make sure that if you are a developer thinking of a new product or even you know, adding new enhancements and features to an existing product, you should be able to test your ideas quickly without a lot of initial setup and inexpensively without you know, breaking your bank. So those three behaviors, if you think about them, uh, really made us you know, decide on self-serve as the model. And the combination of the simplicity of the products that we have and the self-serve model that we have created is working out really well. One thing more that is happening, especially when we are talking about uh, kind of uh, not only making these technologies accessible to more people, but also kind of democratizing them. And that's what cloud does. Uh, so you, 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 in, in a way, uh, one thing more happened last year because of this pandemic, uh, it kind of accelerated a lot of companies or organizations, or even individuals, you know, they are rushing towards digital transformation, they are rushing towards cloud. And the way we work has also changed because we are all working remotely now. We are not sitting in the corporate uh, firewall. Uh, due to this change in demand for the cloud, due to also a lot of companies who are not that tech savvy as you would want for your <laughs> uh, target audience, uh, how are you trying to cater to this new breed of users? How do you help them with onboarding so that they can leverage these technologies that you earlier said, you know, to make it more uh, accessible to them? Uh, at the same time, uh, they should not have to compromise with how fast they want to move and also how secure it is. Of course, it's just a lotion, so you are taking care of security. But let's talk about that aspect as well to, to cater to this new audience, which is rushing towards cloud. Yeah, I mean, you know, every, we all have seen that one one bright light, if if I might say, that we have seen during the whole pandemic year is is cloud. Like cloud has enabled so much activity. Uh, it has enabled us to do our jobs. It has enabled us to do business while still maintaining, you know, social distancing. Um, it has. It is true for us as well. I would say, like in terms of the experience that we are able to provide, there are two differentiations. One one is around your buying experience. And the second is around your product experience. And I'll come back to you know, how it impacts both technical as well as non-technical audiences. Um, in terms of buying experience, as I mentioned earlier, we don't cater to enterprises. Enterprises have these long you know, buying cycles and processes. They're full of complexity. You have to go through committees and all that. What we try to do is we, we want to cater to the person who will come to our website, understand what we have to offer and make a decision right there. So we want to we try to provide as much as much information as transparently and as easily consumable as possible right there on our website. Uh, so that makes the whole buying process easier. The second is once you have bought, once you have made a decision to come into our ecosystem, what does your product experience look like? You know, for for many of the large cloud providers, you will see that you go to their cloud control panel and they make it super complex for you. They throw like hundreds of services at you. And in many cases, you don't even understand what many of those services do. There are like 15 ways of doing the same thing sometimes. Uh, not the case with us. We do not have you know, hundreds of services. We build 15 to 20, and they are all uh, super optimized for a developer's experience. They are easy to use, and we want to make sure, you, make sure that you get started with your projects as easy as possible. So that's for developers. 
And for, for people with slightly less technical skills, I would say a couple of things that we do. We have a set of partners who basically take our products and our platform and they build a slightly high level abstraction on top of us in terms of catering to people who do not have development jobs, who do not have technical skills to be able to directly engage with an infrastructure and platform offering that we provide. They provide a slightly high level experience to people who just want to build websites or stand up their you know, um, you know, e-commerce sites. So, so number one, we rely on that segment. Secondly, within our within our product set, we have this concept of a marketplace. In marketplace, we provide you, you know, fully composed images of popular open source stacks that you can just click and deploy collectively, full, fully together, without needing to do a lot of con configuration and installation yourself. At that point, what you get is an experience that you would, you know, uh, that is not necessarily for a system administrator or a developer, but somebody who just wants to mess around or, you know, um, focus on creating websites and applications. So those are the two things I would say we are kind of focusing on. Right. And if you can also talk a bit about what kind of projects are you seeing developers are building on digital, especially as we're talking about this pandemic phase? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, as, as I mentioned, like we provide a very horizontal uh, cloud platform composing of, you know, compute, network, storage, databases, and we see all kinds of applications being built. Um, some examples are, you know, web applications, uh, SaaS applications, uh, e-commerce websites, uh, CMS, content management system-based websites, things like WordPress. Uh, we also see a lot of uh, streaming media applications being built on our platform because we have a very competitive bandwidth offering uh, as compared to the rest of the market. We see uh, games, um, backends for games being built, backends for mobile applications, API services and API backends. So all, all kinds of applications and, you know, through the pandemic, you know, things have just taken off. If SaaS is a very popular model these days, as you know, um, it's the new mobile app of, of this decade, I would say. 10 years ago, everyone was trying to build mobile apps. Now it is SaaS. Like any, any idea you might have, you're trying to build a SaaS application. Whether you are an individual developer uh, just hacking away or you're a team of like 10 to 15 developers, the first thing that most people try to do to get their idea out is build a SaaS application. So we see a lot of activity in that area. When we look at DigitalOcean, uh, who would you define as your target audience? Because as we were talking earlier, you know, uh, there are people, individuals, there are even home users, consumers, and there, there are enterprise customers. There are small and medium businesses. Everybody needs cloud. Everybody is rushing to the digital transformation. So who are you looking at your core audience? And how do you serve them? Yeah, I mean, our, our core audience are developers and startups and small and medium businesses. And, you know, in all of these contexts, it is mostly technical audiences who are trying to build something. They are either trying to build a body of knowledge. They're trying to build applications. They're trying to build small businesses. We feel that this segment has been grossly underserved by specifically the cloud providers, but also technology industry in general. And I think we are maybe one of the only cloud providers in the market that can confidently say that we are hyper-focused on the, on the needs of this segment. Um, we, are a, we are a company of developers building products for developers. Not too long ago, we were, a, uh, we were a startup ourselves. So we have not lost that ethos. We know what it is like to be a small business and try to create digital applications. And we want to make sure that that is a facility that is uh, available to everyone, accessible to everyone, and economically viable for everyone. That's kind of our mission, simplifying cloud computing so that developers and businesses can spend their time building software that changes the world, and we take care of uh, the infrastructure. Raman, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about uh, not only the, of course, the serve service model, but we also went deeper into how you are serving uh, the needs of, as you mentioned, developers, SMEs, who do need uh, some little bit of hand-holding, not too much, but then they can also take care of themselves. So thanks for explaining that, and I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Swapnil. Always a pleasure. <laughs>